Hello there, this is Julian Humphreys, and in this video I'm going to talk about the Battle of Barnet. And to illustrate it, I'm going to use the toys that helped me get interested in the Wars of the Roses in the first place, Britain's brilliant Swap It Knights. Actually, you may have seen me pushing them around tables at festivals like um, Barnet, Chalk Valley, Tewkesbury and Bosworth. Now, the firm that made them, uh, William Britons Limited, had been making model soldiers for ages. But in the 1950s, they recognised that the lead soldier was coming to an end as a mass market toy, at least. And so they began producing plastic models. Now, over the years, they've produced a huge range of plastic um, models. But the Swap It Knights that they sold between about 1959 and 1972 have to be the jewel in their plastic crown. And Roy Selwyn Smith, the man who designed most of them, was a true master of his craft. Here's one of their catalogues from 1969. As the cover suggests, they made all sorts of things, actually, uh, farms, zoos, even plastic gardens, and of course, a wide range of uh, figures, uh, foot guards, cowboys and Indians, household cavalry, American Civil War, American War of Independence. But it's really these knights that stand out. Here's what the blurb says about them. Magnificent models of 15th century knights to relive the Wars of the Roses, made in the Swapet tradition which Britons originated. All parts fitting firmly yet easily detached. Lifting visors, removable swords, swivelling bodies, all brightly coloured and adorned with their heraldic devices, available singly or in the handsome presentation boxes illustrated. Anyway, I loved these figures as a kid and over the past few years I've started hunting them down again at toy fairs, antique shops and of course on eBay. OK, let's take a look at some of the figures. Well, in true Wars of the Roses spirit, these guys come in a choice of red or white surcoats. Now, they're described in the catalogue as with pike. But as you can see, there is actually a choice of bill or halberd, which you can actually swap around. I think that the helmets with their heraldic crests and mantling would be a bit more appropriate hanging over a stall in the garter chapel at Windsor or at a pinch in a tournament. But they certainly add colour and I was always on the lookout for the bare and ragged stuff of Warwick. The favoured foot knights, amongst my mates anyway, were this pair, one with a sword and one with an axe. You can see that the visors go up and down. Unfortunately, they also come off. And I've often wondered how many over the years got sucked up by vacuum cleaners across the country. You can also see how roses are used to hold on the shields. Very clever, if heraldically a bit iffy. Now, moving on to the mounted knights. Well, these came with lances or um, swords. Although in true swap it spirit, you could actually replace the sword with an axe. I certainly did. You can see that there's also a choice of horse furniture. More mounted knights, this time with lances. I was never a great fan of the purple caparisons, but I would have been delighted to get the figure at the front because of the crest on the knight. Over the years, the figures came in a variety of boxes, packages and stands. One of the most intriguing was a box that looked like a medieval tent, but the only drawback was you couldn't actually see what was inside it. So eventually they compromised with this, still a bit tenty, but with a cellophane front to display what was on sale. And then the back. Here we are. Buy your toy and get a free history lesson about the Wars of the Roses. Actually, it's not too bad. And as I say, it certainly got me into the period. Right. As I said at the beginning, I've started bringing some of these figures together with some pretty rubbish scenery, to be honest, to festivals around the country. And I shoved them around on a board in an attempt to explain some of the battles of the Wars of the Roses. Well, obviously, that's not going to happen this year. But as today is the anniversary of the Battle of Barnet, I thought I'd have a go at doing it in a video. I should say it was quite a sunny day, so I shot it in the garden. And this will explain the enormous tulips that you might see looming over the village of Barnet. So what was Barnet all about? Well, to get to the bottom of it, we really need to look at the career of this fellow, Richard Neville, 16th Earl of Warwick, the man who's gone down in history as Warwick the Kingmaker. This depiction of him, incidentally, is on the tomb of his father-in-law in St Mary's Church in Warwick. Now, Warwick had played a major part in helping the Yorkist Edward IV secure the crown in 1461, and he'd been the king's right-hand man in the years that followed. But this alliance began to fall apart as the years went on, especially after Edward IV married Elizabeth Woodville and Warwick found himself losing influence to the new Queen's family. 
Now, uh, Warwick did his best to destroy the Woodfills and control Edward, but when this proved impossible, he entered into an extraordinary alliance of convenience with his old enemy, Margaret of Anjou, the wife of Henry VI. In 1470, they forced Edward IV into exile and restored Henry VI to the throne. But Edward wasn't the kind of man to take this lying down, and the following March he returned to England, raised an army and re-entered London. On the 13th of April, he led his troops out of the capital and he headed up the Great North Road in search of Warwick, who was camped with his army just outside of Barnet, which was then a small village about 12 miles north of London. Now Edward passed through Barnet, but as it was getting dark, he decided to pitch camp in order of battle, ready for an attack on the following day. But because it was so dark, he came up much nearer to Warwick's army than he actually thought. Now Warwick was well equipped with guns and he decided to take advantage of the situation by ordering a nighttime bombardment of Edward's position. But because the armies were so close, his guns overshot and they blazed away all night to no great effect. The following day was Easter Sunday. The two armies were deployed in the traditional three divisions, although exactly where we're still unsure. However, what we do know is that Edward commanded the centre of the Yorkist army and the two wings were led by his brother, Richard of Gloucester, and his close friend, William Hastings. But who was on the left and who was on the right isn't clear. I've depicted it here with Richard of Gloucester on the right. Warwick's army was also deployed in three battles. Warwick and his brother Montague were in the centre, the Duke of Exeter was on the left and the Earl of Oxford on the right. Both sides also had guns. Right, so here are my swap it knights all drawn up for action. Now most of the men at arms here are in full armour. Now this of course wouldn't have been the case. Many troops would have worn padded jerkins or even no armour at all. But since Britain's never made any figures like that, I couldn't depict them. We've got a few troops here with pole arms, bills and halberds, but in reality a lot more than those would have fought with such weapons. Each of these chaps in this uh, diagram represents maybe, I don't know, 250 to 300 men. Now look at the way that they've deployed. This was another effect of Edward's nighttime arrival. The two armies aren't drawn up exactly opposite to each other. Oxford's troops on the Lancastrian right overlap their Yorkist opponents. And on the other side of the battlefield, the troops on the Yorkist right overlap their opponents. Now this alignment was to have a major effect on the course of the battle. Although because it was a very foggy morning, neither side was really aware of what had happened. Now, the Great Chronicle of London reports, it happened to be so exceeding a mist that neither host could plainly see the other. OK, as you can see, it wasn't exactly a misty morning when I took these shots, so we need to put that right. So here we go. But we'll keep it fairly brief and not too foggy. Otherwise, we'll be as confused as the soldiers were on the actual day. Anyway, when battle was joined, the men on Edward's left found themselves outflanked by the Earl of Oxford's division. They soon broke and fled down the road to Barnet. Some went on to London where they spread miserable stories of Edward's defeat. Oxford's men chased after them. Ideally, if he could have kept control of his men, Oxford could have turned in on the flank of Edward IV, but it seems that the lure of the shops of Barnet proved too great for his troops, who set about looting the village and the enemy's baggage, ignoring Oxford's attempts to rally them and bring them back to the fighting. Meanwhile, in the centre, completely unaware of what had happened, the two sides battled away in the fog, with Edward IV as usual in the thick of the action. Further east, where they overlapped the Lancastrians, the Yorkist right had pushed back their opponents and were actually beginning to put more pressure on the Lancastrian centre. Finally, though, Oxford did manage to rally at least some of his men and they headed back up the road from Barnet to rejoin the fray. But the effects of the fighting had seen the two armies pivot. And so instead of attacking the Yorkists, Oxford's men were now advancing on the flank of their allies. Now, thinking that these new men were actually a fresh party of Yorkists, Warwick's men turned on them and the Lancastrian army began to crumble amidst cries of treason. Eventually it fell apart and they ran for their lives. Not all of them made it, and one who didn't was the Earl of Warwick. As he struggled back to try to get to his horse, he was overtaken and killed. Edward's victory and Warwick's death had broken the power of the Nevilles. 
Three weeks later, Edward secured his crown by destroying Queen Margaret's army at Tewkesbury, and he'd reign unchallenged for more than a decade until his death in 1483. So that, in brief, is the Battle of Barnet. If you'd like to know more, why not check out the Resource Centre on the Battlefields Trust website? That's www.battlefieldstrust.com. Barnet also has an excellent medieval festival. Again, check out the Trust website for details of when the next one can be held. And also, when these difficult times are over, why not pay a visit to the battlefield itself? It is, after all, the only Wars of the Roses battlefield you can get to by tube. <laughs>